recording. We're good to go. Share screen. Okay, so we'll minimize that. Put that down. Okay, so my name's Craig, uh, Craig Harland, but uh, I answer the agent helpline calls. So if you call the agent helpline, chances are good you're going to get me because I do it most of the time. Occasionally I get a little relief and we're working on training someone up to give me maybe weekends off. So um, at this point, it's probably me. People call and go, it's you again? Yes, yeah, me. <laughs> so I'm there to help you. It's not, I mean, don't always call if you have a question because the, the, you know, people call, oh, this may be a dumb question. No, there's no dumb question if you call to ask it because you're ahead of the person that didn't ask it and did something incorrectly because they didn't ask. So uh, it's there to help you guys through the process of learning the process. And today is designed to give you kind of a 3,000 foot overview. I'm screen sharing, but I do need to make sure it's recording. I'm not 100% sure it's recording. Not video. More. I guess it's recording so we don't have to pause recording. So I want to give you an idea of the tools that we use at my home group when you have a buyer. Uh, a little bit of the process you're going to go through a little more than you got in real estate school that teaches you. So I presume everyone's fairly new. You've been around a little bit. So pretty new. Just got licensed or nope, been around a bit. Just trying to sharpen the sword a little bit. Never did, I never did a buyer. Okay. Oh, you've been listings or buying for yourself or fixer uppers? Okay. Well, that's a good place to be as listings right now. So um, as long as you get them priced properly, but the uh, the buyers are certainly challenging right now because of interest rates. We can't fix that. So we have to figure out how do we work around that. I'm gonna show you a tool to help a buyer that's maybe on the fence, uh, talk about the interest rates. Um, so I, I just do a little outline, mostly to keep myself moving in the right direction, but I'm open to questions wherever it's not, you know, particularly structured. Uh, I'm really ready to jump around and tell you, answer what you guys need to hear. So basically, uh, I want to talk first about the kind of the primary form. And it's not. So it's the buyer agency form. Let's see if I have it in this. Hmm. Can't believe I didn't have it in that one. So we'll add it. Real, real estate agency and disclosure and election buyer. Um, so that's kind of the form that would lay out what your responsibilities are to a buyer. It doesn't have any uh, talk about compensation. Obviously, our world is going to be different with some big lawsuits that just one just got one and a couple got settled for some really big numbers. Um, so we're going to talk briefly about another form you may want to consider with buyers down moving forward. And I think we'll probably be forced to use it moving forward. And that's talking about the money form. But this is really talking about responsibility. What are you responsible for as the broker working through myself? Um, talks about if you're just a buyer's broker, what you're responsible for, your fiduciary duties, which is a whole class given by the brokers about the carload uh, of fiduciary duties. Uh, carload is like the first, this is in a different order, but confidentiality, accounting, whatever. It's somehow they put those in or not in the carload, but a different order than this, but um, basically accounting, confidentiality, you need to... Uh, be responsible to the buyer through this. You could also be responsible to the seller's broker, which you've been doing before. Again, you have the same duties. What we run into a lot at a company the size of my home group is the property that your buyer wants to see is listed within the my home group agent. 
Like be your own property listing if you're, you know, have it someone coming into an open house. But number three, buyer representing both the buyer and seller, we call that limited representation. You're a bit handcuffed in that you can't, um, you're reserved on what you can tell either side to some degree. You can't tell the buyer that the seller, you know, listed this property and he said, we're going to ask for 375, but you know, God, we take 350 in a minute. You can't tell him that unless the seller has said, tell him I'll take 350. Then you can. So you, you get a buyer comes through your open house, it's listed at 375. He goes, Yeah, I think it's priced too high. You can go, here's the comps. What do you want to offer? So they have to make that decision. You, because you know private information that you have a fiduciary responsibility to keep private that you can't share with the buyer. Does that make sense in terms of splitting that up? Uh, that's the best example I can come up with, but there's a myriad of other places where you can get that convoluted. So you, you can give a little less information. You can always give market data to both sides, but you can't give the motivational factor. Person says, gosh, I, you know, I'm getting a divorce. I need out of this fifth house. You can't tell that to the buyer unless the seller has said, let people know, I'm getting a divorce. I need this house sold by the end of next month. Then you can let the public know. If it's not something you can tell the public, you can't tell the other party that you're limited representation on. So <laughs> our brokers have taken the policy that, and, and really it makes sense, but we want both to represent the buyer as buyer's broker and show buyer properties with listing brokers firm. We want both 35 and 37 checked on all transactions uh, in, in less if you have specific instructions and you, you don't want to do limited, you can tell the buyer you're only representing the seller. But in most cases, you're going to be putting this in your file with both of these checked because you don't know what properties they want to look at yet. And you could be taking them over here to the uh, Realty One Group listing and they go, what about that one across the street? Well, you didn't check the box that said, I can show you my home group property, so I can't show that one to you. Clearly... We want to show them what they want to what they want to buy. So we want to have both of those checked. And this is a form that should be done. I would say before you do serious showing, like I might show them one property to get to know them, you know, one or two. If it's kind of a, a cold call come in, I, I you know get to know them a little bit and say, well, lay out the here's what I do for a buyer. This explains it. Just need to have you kind of acknowledge that in that meeting might be after you've shown them the first house or two. It might be kind of after you walk them through an open house and built a rapport and realize they want to continue working. So at that point, you want to work through this form. Talks nothing about compensation. So the form that talks about compensation, which is kind of always been a optional form, I would say that... Uh, In the future, we're going to be, this is going to be almost mandatory. And I would, I'm sure our brokers, uh, I know we'll be doing more classes on specifically on this because you kind of need to know how to present it. But this is talking about compensation. So you're likely to see on the MLS buyer, buyer broker compensation to go down. MLS has approved it here to go to zero. I haven't seen that come out yet, but somebody's going to start doing that. Um, so this is the only way that you're going to get paid showing a buyer around is if the buyer agrees to pay you. So you're going to come in here and I would say that this is a good practice in, in the market to have a minimum. The retainer fee is probably not competitive, but have a minimum uh, commission that you're willing to accept. You know. So when did that ruling come down? I remember seeing it. Two days ago. Really? $1.75 billion. There, so the prior, so two companies settled, uh, two two of the lawsuits were settled by major companies, Remax and Hollywood, like a week and a half earlier. This is the third case. It went to jury, jury deliberated in like two days and it came out uh, Monday. It came out Monday. It might've been Friday, but it, it was kind of hitting the press on Monday. Um, and 1.7 billion the plaintiffs are NAR, Keller Williams, uh, Remax, and I believe Anywhere is in that one also. Anywhere is Cobo Banker, Sotheby's, a couple of other major firms under that Anywhere uh, umbrella. 
So that's a big number. And so that's saying what? So what that's saying is that these companies, uh, I'm going to use the word cheating, but they're using the fancy word. It's saying that they put money out of the seller's pocket to pay the buyer. That they would, didn't do the buyer, the seller the service by, by having the buyer's commission paid. So it's not the buyers that were suing for that. They didn't have to pay anything. It was the sellers who say, hey, you told me I had to pay 3% to the buyer's agent or you, you wouldn't pay my listing. So now the MLS has said, and they used to, Say you had that A number in there, here. and since the suits were coming up like a month ago, this our arm was said, no, you can put zero. Before that, you saw occasionally you see a hundred dollars or something, uh, not very often, but occasionally you see a listing with a hundred bucks. So that's okay. I'm not going to show that unless my buyer. But on the other hand, your fiduciary duty is to get the best thing that your buyer needs. So if that's the property they need, you should show it, even if it's only a hundred dollars thing. So to protect yourself. You get this sign with your minimum commission you want to go set. And I would argue probably not the what we used to think was uh, you know norm. I'm not supposed to say norm with Federal Trade Commission. Is this re be recording? <laughs> uh, you know, not three percent, but if the if what's going on seems to be two, two and a quarter, two and a half, maybe you say I'm I'll set my minimum at two and a half, or I'll set my minimum to you decide. And if the if the property offers a lower commission than that, then the buyer has a closing cost to you of the difference. Uh, because what it says in here, da, da, da. I'm on the wrong form, because why? Residential agency, here, here we go. Retainer fee, compensation. The amount of compensation shall be, you're gonna set it right here in line 30. Um, and if the amount received from the seller is greater, great, you get to keep it. If it's less, then the buyer has to make up the difference. So. That's your your that's where you need to show your value to the buyer. You just say, I'm valuable. I'm gonna be able to put the deal together. I'm gonna be able to make sure your documentation doesn't get you in trouble. I'm gonna advise you on where to get inspections and what you should have inspected. So I have a value to you, and I believe my value is this number. And you're gonna find that um, the the market, we don't know what's gonna happen down the road. In the past, I know some agents who wouldn't put someone in their car without this sign, even in the past when there was, you know, an MLS that supported them getting paid directly from the seller all the time. So it's just a good form to put in the back of your mind and, and think we're going to be seeing a lot more of it. Some states it's mandatory and has been. Other states, not. That it's probably going to become a mandatory form just to protect, all, you know, everyone. And, you know, what, what you're going to see potentially is the listing agents become it's the place to be because if they go, I'm paying zero and the buyers figure out, well, they can go to the listing agent and they don't have to pay a buyer's broker, then, then why am I going to go? Like England is not buyers, right? Yeah. So you, you, what you're going to find is buyer's agents are going to get squeezed out, down or out, probably down. Uh, a good buyer's agent that can show some value. Some of them say, yeah, I'm, I'm, I understand. Until you start seeing legal disputes because there was one party representing both, the seller representing both parties, and the buyer now feels they were cheated by the seller's agent, and those lawsuits come up, buyers aren't going to realize hey, they can get into, into trouble by not being represented. It's like, would you go to, would you go in front of the judge, say you got in a car accident, and, uh, the insurance company said, well, you know, there's no more. We're not going to pay uh, attorneys for the plaintiff anymore. So, you know, you're, the only attorney that's going to be there is the insurance company's attorney. And we're going to go in front of the judge and the judge will decide. Are you going to be happy just going over here and saying, well, okay, that guy seems pretty nice at the insurance company. I, I'm sure he'll get take good care of me. No, guess what? He wants to cut the best deal for the insurance company. Always has, always will. So people logically see that, oh, I've got to get an attorney. But if the courts in, in those kind of lawsuits said, we're no longer going to allow percentage deals, are people going to write a check for 30 grand? There's lawsuits that don't happen because there aren't attorneys waiting in line to, to do contingency deals. Therefore, the, people don't have the deep pockets. An example is a uh, condition of real estate property. Let's say something wasn't disclosed on the spuds and it clearly should have been. 
no one's taking that on contingency. So yes, you bought it and all of a sudden you've got this huge expense that you've got, but you don't know how you're going to handle it. And the spuds clearly said, there's no problem with this house. Um, but you feel like they lied on the spuds. So you feel like you have a case against them. The only way that's going to get heard is if you've got, and it's not even going to get to court for ten or fifteen thousand dollars. It's going to get to mediation. If it heck, the heck they have to go to court, your number's going up. So the average home buyer doesn't have fifteen grand to hire an attorney to go take two years and, and beat the other side up. So. Uh, I think they'll pay a little bit, but not what they're paying now. You know. I mean, they're, you know, it's a marketing thing for them and they'll be, they'll say, Hey, if I, you know, but I think you're going to see the numbers go way down. We'll see. I mean, it's it's going to be a whole different world five years from now. I don't know how long that's going to take. So today we operate in our world, but start thinking about a buyer broker agreement. Um, so the buyer agency form, the buyer broker agreement, and the other form that I would argue that you, you probably want to consider up front, in, and maybe it's a welcome email because you don't necessarily need it signed up front, but we're always kind of putting it in the package to, at closing, and that's the buyer advisory. It's a little late at that point to say, here's the things you should check out, you know, whether it's been on a uh, sex offenders list, whether it's got uh, glow, whether it's glowing because there was a chemical plant here years ago. Um, I'm going to show you the place to go get the one that you want to put in your email. And uh, I'm on AAR online, which is Arizona Association online. And buyer, if you go to the buyer advisory here, I didn't want sample forms. I want the buyer advisory. So when you look at it, it's got a lot of blue links in there. But when you create that as a PDF out of transaction desk, the links go away. But here you can download the buyer advisory and you can get it in Spanish. And if I download it here, the links will be live. So I like to have this download saved to my computer, send it out to my client in an email. Here's some things as you're looking at buying a house that you may want to consider. And as you're going through here, when I click that, it's going to open that page. So it's much more useful of a tool to the buyer. So that would be the third form. Uh, that I want to have before I put the buyer in a car. And that's usually in an introductory. Maybe I'm getting the buyer agency form and I'm sending out, hey, thank you. I look forward to looking at these houses. Here's a buyer advisory form that you may want to keep in the back of your mind as you're looking at houses. Uh, click through the links. It'll take you to, you know, some things you want to investigate about the property and feel free to ask me questions about this through the process. But go to AAR get the live link version, save it as a PDF. It doesn't upload too often and you'll know when it gets uploaded, I mean, updated. So home research. So obviously uh, clients going to say, you know, uh, and I'm talking less about re finding a house because I'm assuming that we've all spent time and know how to go search a neighborhood and find a three bedroom, 2000 square foot house for 399 in the area. Uh, on search on flex, but um, I'm less flex. So I'm not really going to focus on that too much. We'll have it open here in case we want it. Again, if you haven't, start spending some time on quick search and figuring out how to, to narrow your searches down. There's a lot of good videos in the uh, guided help or in the help. They've got videos here up in the upper right. But let's assume they, they say, okay, I, I, I like these few houses to look at and I want to learn about them a little bit. One of the least used from when I talk to people, um, RPR Mobile. Have you ever heard of RPR? Have you used RPR? Awesome. You need to. <laughs> and the, the mobile even more so than the one on here. But the one on here, you, so I'm in, I'm in Flex and that's going to automatically carry my login to RPR. The first time you've got to put your NAR number in and, and get linked to it. Um, they have a lot of videos on how to do it, how to use it. So, you know, the most recent one is they've got a new market data information. It's not as good or as detailed as our local Crumford report, which I love and we'll talk a little bit about, but it's, it's good information. It actually will write a video script for you if you want to, you know, they has, has an AI built in to do a video script, uh, 
if people, so we're going to look at the RPR mobile more so than this showing it right now. Okay. RPR. So when you're driving around a neighborhood, and, and we've got our, my home group app that you, as you're driving around a neighborhood, you could use that to pull up a property, but it's not going to give you as much information. So that's more of a consumer, give it to your consumer to go look for houses in a neighborhood. Uh, okay, come on. Should, come on, recognize my face. So the RPR mobile app, you can do a lot of great reports on the other one, seller report, if you can have out a list and it gives you 82 pages of detail. I usually cut it back and make, you know, it's a little more impactful. People will read 20 pages. They're not going to read 82 pages of what's going on in the neighborhood. But RPR mobile has a half a mile. I can search what property is around me. If you're driving around and someone says, why didn't we see that house? I'm going to pull it up on RPR. It'll tell me if it's pending. It'll also tell me the, the details of it. We're going to look at one for sale. Or 10. So it's an active condo. Obviously, we're not in an area that has a lot of houses. We'll go switch it over, but um, give me the size. So, you know, I can tell somebody, well, you said you actually have to have, you know, three bedroom condos. So that's why this one didn't show up on your list. Because you get that question when you're driving people around. But that's sign across the street. So let's say... Let's go over where there's some houses, remove the boundary, and zero in. You, you'll notice it's it's got a dot where I am over here. So if you're in a neighborhood and you're trying to find the house, it'll the dot will be in the middle and you'll be able to see the one that's right down the block. So I have to come over here where there's some actual properties for sale. And, okay, so here we go. Uh, 715, 750, that one's got an open house coming up. And we get to see what it looks like, two bin, two bath. So it's a it's a handy tool that you can't give this tool to your clients, but it's a handy tool for you to find out what's around the block. But let's say they you're gonna go look at that and they say, What you know, do you think it's worth that? They have this RBM realtor valuation model, uh, and it can it uh, if you're using the adjustments and the adjustments in here, you can be more specific. Hey, they just put a pool in, it's got a new kitchen, you it's got sliders. So Unlike trying to do comps somewhere else, you have to think, well, what's a new kitchen with? You can go, it's, an, it's a better than average kitchen. You move the slider over. It's going to put a generalized number in for you, which is way better than throwing a dart at what a new kitchen costs. If they put a pool in the backyard and it doesn't say it on the record, you can put that as an improvement. Um, that I would be a two-hour class to show you this. Other than get it, watch their videos, learn it, uh, but have it on mobile and on the on the desktop. So let's look at this property. 908. What is RPM standpoint? Realtor valuation model. Uh, 90, 9083. The other thing you can do is if let, let's do it on mobile. So let's say that I'm looking at that house and the people go, oh, you know, could could you do a little more? You can say, you know, I don't know, I can put together a report for you. You may not want to like send it to him right now because then you'll realize that you didn't spend as much time on it. But you say, well, when I got home, I'll send you a report. But you could go in here and uh, hit next and run the report. And it's going to take a little while. But, you know, I, I spent a couple hours last night looking at the demographics and the income levels and the schools and everything else. And here's your 82 page report. If you're dealing with an engineer or a lawyer, he's going to love you. If you're dealing with an artist, they're going to go, God, that's way too much information. So, you know, you use it with discretion and cut out the pages. It's easier to cut pages out when you do it on, do a property report on here. Same thing when you're going out on a listing appointment, the seller's report is very comprehensive. Um, so it's going to take a while to generate, but, and it lost my connection because it's trying to generate that. So I don't know what happened. Oh, does this sit down there? No. I don't know what happened because I have another app or two I wanted to show you. Quick time. Okay, there we go. So the other app I'm going to show you is, well, MHG. You were all here in Jenny's class, so I'm not going to talk about the MHG app. But the other app I'd love to show you is Agent One. 
Chicago title. Uh, if you grab a card from Anna and she'll get you linked up, you do have to pay a one time or it might be annual. It's under 20 bucks. It might be 19.99 or 14.99. I can't remember. Um, but it's very valuable for someone saying, what's my payment going to be? And so we're going to look at Chicago. Agent one. Chicago title agent one. So that app is loading here. They just added a new calculator in here. It, it calculates payments like crazy. They have kind of some social posts that talk about, you know, affordability and you can change the amounts to be the price range that you want to target. Um, but in the calculators, they've got a new one, then versus now. And a home equity calculator, but then versus now. The cool thing about this is it needs to load up. Somebody says, well, I want to, you know, it's it's 8%. It's it's a lot. I can afford it, but it's a lot. So I'm going to wait for the interest rates to come down. So if interest rates came down to five and three quarters, what do you think is going to happen to the buyer demand? Because, because everybody's sitting on their hands waiting and it's going to go through the roof. So if do any of you remember watching the market a little bit, if you weren't agents, just being on the outside, 2021, what was happening? There were 15 offers on day one on a halfway decent property. Not great property, halfway decent property. 15 offers on day one and the poor home buyer who could qualify for the price and, and put his 5% down was getting beat out by the investment offer that was putting an extra 50 grand on the table. So you, you, your client runs the risk of having not only to pay a higher price because the sellers are going to boost their price when there's that much demand, but having to pay more than that. And then they need more cash besides their down payment. So that's the risk of saying, and this kind of calculates it. So conventional loan, 10%, 2003, a 23 offer, List price. So let's say it's a four hundred fifty thousand dollars house right now. Okay, and that's probably a little low now. I'm gonna I'm gonna put an eight, and they say, okay, I I think that. Hmm, I thought I could change the year. I think I can. I haven't used it enough yet, but uh, we'd have to put it down here. So. You could just, I don't know why that year is stuck at that because you'd want to do, let's say they think, okay, interest rates are going to get back down to six. And let's say that taxes, we're going to leave everything the same there. So let's say this house was 450 at the low end the prior year. I think there's a way to change that year because you want to project it into the future. At any rate, I, too much detail here I have to put in, but uh, yeah, rates 4.65, not going to happen, but you get the idea. You can put the interest rate today at eight and the interest rate in the future at six and three quarters or six and a half. Say, if rates go down, you're probably going to be paying another 15% more in price, at least 10, because the buyer activity is going to go up. And because of that, over time, where are you going to be? And it'll, it runs those scenarios over time. So, the, but the even more important thing about this app is just being able to calculate payments for someone when they're looking at a house. You have to kind of know by talking to the lender ahead of time what rates are kind of hovering around, but you can give a definitive answer to somebody and say, can I afford this? Here's the payment, you know. You tell me, payment's going to be higher than you would have hoped because the interest rates are high, but you need a place to live and maybe you should get in, you know, Rates are going to do one of two things. One of three things. Rates are going to go up, they're going to stay the same, or they're going to go down. If they go up, you'll be happy you got in because you've got it, it went up. If they stay the same, you'll be ambivalent. You, you got in, it's the same, no big deal. If they go down, the price has gone up. And you won't, may not even be able to get in the house because you're going to have much more competition. So if, if they go down and you bought, then you can refinance. If they go down and you didn't get in, 
you may be left on the sideline again because many people feel left on the sideline from 21. So they're going to maybe relate to that. So use tools like that. But the, but the, just the basic calculator of calculating a mortgage and what if I put another $5,000 down or another 5% down, it'll rerun the number. You can let them know. So it makes you a little less dependent on getting a call. to the, is, You need one call to the, it, to the loan officer so you know what the rate to plug in, but you don't need all the calls. Thank you. AI thing that works well for the uh, board this one. Um, I just watched the video last week, so I'm trying to Create script right here. Uh, I want to create a video script. And it's it's going to create a different script each time. It's kind of like if you ask Shut GPT the same question, it always comes. So it's not like your script's going to be the same script I get. And if I close out of this, I'm not going to see the same exact script again. I mean, the, some of the facts will be in there. Um, Hi, good day, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another market update. I'm Craig Harlan. Uh, so it also, you, you can copy the screens that you see in the picture to drop into your video. Uh, talks about, it tells you which screens to drop in, transition to a display. So I could take that and I would go down here and pick up the appropriate screens. You're going to do these and share it as a, you're probably not going to share it directly. You want to save it, each one. So you're going to capture that, have it as a slide so you can drop it on your video. I mean, it takes a little bit of doing the video record because you're going to do a face on, but you want the other screens popping up. So you're going to use, um, a, you know, iMovie or DaVinci Resolve or something. You're going to have to have some uh, bit of CapCut, probably could do it on CapCut. So you're going to save these, you know, ones they talk about, save those as a file, and then you can go drop them in as you're uh, doing the video. So, and that works on all the market research products, um, the trends products. So kind of cool. Saves you from going to check GPT. So with the same kind of technology. Uh, so your client loves a house. Where do you start? Uh, communication is, I think, the most important thing that we sometimes forget in, in our rush. Call the listing agent. See if there's any pending offers, um, things that are important to the seller. You know, oh, the seller, you know, needs this amount of time to close or they need to close fast or, you know, things. I always, I, I, you know, we're looking at putting together an offer. What's important to the seller besides the money? Because the money, they've told you, this is what we want. Um you know, we want $450,000. What else is important to the seller? Well, you know, he really would like to get close so he could buy his other house and get his kids in school. And, you know, maybe a post occupancy is important to him. You can talk to your buyer about the risk of that. They've left someone in the house. If they don't move out, how do they deal with that? But you get the point is, is communicate and find out what would make my offer stand out to the seller and make them say, okay. Because maybe, maybe I'm going to offer a little less. Maybe I'm not willing to offer more. I'm willing to offer the price, but the, putting them, I always, putting the money aside, what else is important? Because those things can sometimes be little details that don't affect your buyer significantly that can make your deal acceptable. Maybe they'll take your offer of a little bit less because you met their other terms. You're going to let them stay in the house until, you know, the end of September. Uh, we're past September now. So, uh, you know, they, they want to have Christmas in the house. Well, let's, but we can close, you know, December 15th and let you move out by January 15th. We're okay with that as a buyer. We don't have to have a place because our lease isn't up till the end of the year or first of the year. Uh, so, you, you, you know, you can massage some of the side things. The next thing is to get the checklist so you know what you're going to need in terms of forms as you're preparing it. So if you go to Broker Sumo, aka My Agent Portal, And let's see, so if I get lucky or it's going to need to send a code, probably. 
almost always needs to send a code. Yep. Oh, six, four, one. So if you come into Broker Sumo and you look under Office Documents, under Arizona, you're going to find a couple of checklists down here. That's one of the easy ones because they're under checklists. Purchase transaction and resale listing transaction and rental transaction. So we're looking at a, a purchase. I'm going to hit the eyeball. I would suggest you hit the download, but we're going to look at it up here. Talks about the standard forms that we're going to need in a deal. Not all of them are up front. Some of them will come like the earnest, the earnest money receipt will come after you've got a deal in title commitment after open escrow. But it'll give you an idea of all of the things that you need to look for. Most of them are going to be in transaction desk. The, the significant thing that's not is going to be the uh, affiliated business disclosure, which is in the same the top of this list, affiliate business disclosure, Phoenix and Tucson. So we need that for every buyer or every seller. Anyone you represent at my home group, we need an affiliated business disclosure signed by them. And it basically says, yeah, we know that VIP, Countrywide, Fairway, all these mortgage companies, uh, warranty, things that might show up on a settlement statement, pay some money to my home group. I mean, we don't as individuals get money, but we get benefit because a warranty company Bought us Tara bought us lunch today. So, but do we send this after we get an approved uh, contract? Or? No, I send this with the con I send this with to the to the my buyer with their paperwork to to make an offer. So when I'm sending that paperwork file on to the listing agent, I'm going to take out things like the buyer advisory, like this, like the wire fraud advisory, things that are just disclosures between our client and us. So the the other agent only names the contract. The addendums, HOA addendum, the uh, you know solar addendum, all those have to go with with the offer. But anything that's uh, just buyer advisory, wire fraud, uh, this form. I'm trying to think of what else that you know uh, the swimming pool. Uh, now that probably should go on with it. it. Just anything that's kind of just between ourselves. That you know the seller's never signing it. The seller's agent doesn't need it. But I'm going to put them in my initial signing package and get them all signed because you're going to, you know, you don't want to be chasing that after the fact because this is kind of a, a disclosure we need on every deal. So transaction desk is, as I said, you're going to want to go hit the house, uh, add a new file. And again, Tay does great transaction desk classes. I'm not going to show you about that, but you're going to come in here. I've already got this one set up. Um, and you're going to add all your forms. I keep adding forms as I'm needing to read one with someone on, online or I'm teaching a class. So I got a whole list in here that's not applicable to any single deal. It's like, so I might have a listing agreement and a purchase agreement in here, but um, you can set up templates. So when you set up a new file, you, you can put in a template for a purchase transaction and it'll pull your, your standard six documents and put them in there. Again, you'll learn that in a transaction desk class. Highly recommend that. Um, but it's not. we're not going to cover that much detail today. I just want to give you the overview. Just saves you time. I had one client back in the 2001 days. Um, we made offers on 15 properties. And after the third one, I did, a, I did a contract template just for her. So all I had to drop in was the address and the amount. Because, I, you know, particular things she wanted, I knew... It's like I made a template so I didn't have to type it every time. So you can do a template just for that specific a situation. Um, but, you know, do a template for your purchase, for your listing, for your standard stuff once you figure out what your forms are. And it makes your life a little quicker setting up a new deal. Um, so has everyone been in the transaction desk? So you've got your login. You know how to do the single sign-on login from Arizona Association. We won't cover that. Uh, inner property info from arm listed to transaction desk. 
the easiest way is, well, two ways. You can either be on a property in MLS and... Two weeks, right? Yeah, two ways to get them, the information in. Once yeah. you start from the MLS, you hit the little down arrow and you hit transaction desk. It's going to assume I'm putting an offer together for that property. Or once I, if I am in transaction desk by itself, I can take that MLS number and drop it in at the beginning. This just brings the number in automatically. It's funny, I had transaction desk open. Why it put me back at the login, I'm not sure. I keep tweaking it. Hmm. Well, they've tweaked that because it used to open up a new deal when I clicked in that way, and it didn't. Weird. Just when you think the tra transaction desk... Okay, well, I can't fix their broken system. I'm sure it'll come back to doing that. Oh, here we go. So I've got my address. I've got the import data from Armless in the middle. Uh, and it pulled the number. If you go into Transaction Desk and you didn't come this way, you can simply pop the MLS number in there. But a lot of times you're talking to a client about the property. It's easy to just click the button on that. Uh, I always name the property, not only the address, but, you know, uh, Something that tells me about the client, um, and you know, so I've got the client's name and the app. So if I'm looking at a list, I know which file I'm looking for, because you will get a list of them. All. Here's here's where the templates are. So I could do a, a purchaser standard. Guess who the one who had 15 offers? It was Bauer. Um, so I can do a standard purchase. Your trend, your um, Templates, if a form gets updated, it comes out of the template. You have to go rebuild it, re-add it in with a new one. So this may not have all the forms in it now. <clears throat> I would tell you as you're going through here, it has a lot more information you can put in than you'll ever use. So I, I do the import and then I'm pretty much ready to hit next because it doesn't matter what the schools are. It's not going to show up in any of your forms. Do you um, prefer going from the site in the MLS? I typically go in from the MLS just because I'm already on the property and it, I don't have to copy the number in because it's it, it, it okay. should be one click once you're already logged into Transaction Desk. Um, but if you are in Transaction Desk alone, just going to have to copy that MLS number in. Uh, I might put the offer date in here because that's uh, you know going to be in the contract. Uh, offer expiration, uh, you can put the date, but you're going to have to put in the contract the time. This won't bring a time in. Uh, but application date, commitment date, you, you don't know the expiration date of the listing. Nothing else really on that page that's, that's going to help you. So I move forward. You're going to put your buyers, you've got your seller here, came over from the, the advantage when you use that MLS input is it puts the seller's information. Be careful because a lot of agents put client of MHG Realty, you know, at, which is really stupid because it takes one more click for any of us to look up the name on, on the tax record. And that field's not public anyway. So I, it's, it's an old school thing where people just think, I'm going to keep my client information private. But, you know, to write a contract, that's just stupid because, you know, you, you need the, you need their name. So you're going to click through to Monsoon, look up their name and type their name in. So if it's got the client of, you know, XYZ Realty, just delete it and and add them as a as the names that you find them on soon. Uh, so I'm the listing agent, buyer's agent. I'm going to add my clients in here now. At this point, add a new transaction contact with their name and their email because I'm going to need their names on the forms and I'm going to need it for the signing later. And then you hit next. I've got all the forms here. Uh, so you'll notice the purchase contract doesn't exist here because it was updated. So. I'm going to have to go add it by itself because this template's an older template. So that's the disadvantage of templates is know that they can lose stuff over time. If it's updated, the new form doesn't go into your template. It's strange that you'd think they could make that work, but... I'm sorry? No, no, has no, we've had seen no change to that. That's, that, this is an old template. Um, 
and it changed early in the year. So a couple things changed in it. So that's what we're going to do today. So once your client, so you're going to go through this. Uh, other things that you may need to bring in the pool safety notice or the lead based approach brochure. Lead based paint, there's a notice that's signed by everybody in transaction desk for houses built prior to 78, which means 1977 and before. Um, but in that form, it says that your buyer has received a copy of lead in your home by the HUD, I think, puts it out, or, or EPA. It's a national form. So it's a form that's called for in our contract because it says your, your buyer's received it, but it doesn't exist in any of our form libraries. So, so you have to go into Google and say, So there's the EPA, protect your family. This is going to be the, no, that's not the right one. I want the actual form. I think that's it. Yeah, so the, the form actually looks like this. It may have blue highlights. This is black and white, doesn't really matter, but it's put out by the EPA and it's this pamphlet type form. So the, the disclosure that is signed by everybody about lead-based paint says that your buyer will get this. And so I always throw it in there. If I throw it in the signing file, it doesn't need to be signed, but I have proof that I delivered it because that authentic sign proof that I delivered it. Uh, it. It's got blue highlights in some of the versions I've seen. This one's black and white. It's the same form. Uh, and the other one is a swimming pool safety notice. If your house has a swimming pool, your buyer, the contract says the buyer has received a copy of the swimming pool safety notice, and it's your responsibility to get that. Um, Arizona Department of Health Services. So that's the form, blue highlights that you need. Probably both of those two forms don't update very often. So you could safely maybe have those saved in your in your computer. The affiliated business disclosure, I would not recommend doing that because the, our attorney updates that anytime we have a change in a partner. So probably on average of three times a year, that one changes. These haven't changed in a long time. So those are two forms you could have kind of ready to go if if it's needed. You're going to use AuthentiSign to send them to your client to sign. Um, again, it's built in here. If I've got a list of forms, yeah, I'm in. So I'm in the transaction. The, the uh, Bill Smith. Well, Jones had some forms too. So I'm in here. I'm going to hit on the far right. I'm going to hit signings. Uh, so that one was already completed and you can hit add button and add a new signing and then start clicking the forms you want, or you can come from forms, close, which the first time out, this is usually what I'll do is I'll click this button. They all get highlighted. Again, this guy's got forms, every kind of form, cause I'm reading it. So you're, you're never having someone find sign 25 documents, but when you click the box, hit the pen. It's going to put all 25 of those into a signing. Most of the forms, it's going to drop your buyer's names in because you've identified them as a transaction um, at, for, at, for signer. Some of the forms, you have to do a read through when you're sending it out because a few of the forms, it doesn't automatically put in the wire fraud advisory. The uh, Obviously, our, our, you know, our form is going to have to be a, come in as a document. It doesn't like having 25 forms. It takes a while. Um, I always like to have my listing agent, uh, have my lender call the listing agent and they can have a little bit of an off balance sheet. You know, they've done a, a prequal, but sometimes that phone call makes a difference. Hey, here's our process. We've already run them all the way through underwriting. These people are solid and they have a little room if interest rates tick up before we get locked. They, you know, we're not like, up against the wall. So they can have a conversation that helps the listing agent make a, make a decision for your, for your client. 
Um, so transaction desk is going to, once you do the signing, it's going to have all the forms, all 25 forms eventually. I can't even quit. Greg, here's a good question. Yeah. If you don't have, if you don't have a property, you're assigning just one assignment, you're fine to get the paperwork, you know, by the way, and stuff like that. You, you, you have to, I think you can just put, uh, set it up as Jones uh, buyer broker and then load them in because neither of those forms have an address. So you could set up a, go to the house on the far left, set, put their name in and put, you know, agency and buyer broker and buyer advisory. And, and you could send just those forms to Bob Jones. And it's going to say Jones initial disclosures. Uh, you send those out and then you have them in your file. You're going to get the PDF back. You'll just hang on to those. The, um, you can do the same thing once you have that. You put, anytime you have an executed form from your client, like the, the buyer, the buyer uh, uh, agency, we don't worry about, but the buyer broker employment agreement, there is a way to put that in SkySlope for our brokers to review it. So you can uh, put it in SkySlope once it's signed. But other than that, it's, it's pretty much like if you're just sending them the buyer advisory and the agency form, you don't have to put it anywhere. You can just hang on to that. Because there's no kind of deal at all. A negotiation on multiple offers. We're not there today. We'll be there again if rates go down. So we'll talk about it for a minute. Uh, you, you contact the listing agent and he says, yeah, we got eight offers. So, and they, they may just, they, they have the choice. They can just pick one. They don't have to do anything. They may come back to three of them and say, there's a form called a multiple counter offer form. So a seller can send that out. If you're representing sellers, you keep this in mind also. You may not send it to all eight because, you know, five of them are like, eh, I don't, they're not even in the game. Why am I going to send it to these guys? But here's three serious offers for either price or, the you know, the way they're financed, cash or solid financing. I'm going to send it to these three and go, I want the best, you know, you have until five o'clock tomorrow to give me your best deal. So if the seller does that and you're one of those three, you can call them up and say, how many other people are in on this? Because the form doesn't say. They go, well, we sent it to three people. Okay. Um, again, you can ask. If, I, if, if you're asking me, I'm not going to give you a clue that's going to make you no more than, than the next guy because I want it to be a fair process. But you can ask, well, what's it going to take for me to get this? And, and they may say, well, the last guy offered, you know, the highest offer of the initial offers was 310. So if you can come in above that, chances are you, you have a pretty good shot at it. But if he's telling that to everybody, then you don't know how much above the 310 it's going to take. So again, you can, you can ask questions. The buyer's agent or the seller's agent may or may not answer them. But I want to know. They should not lie because that's unethical. Even to the other agent? Even to the other agents, unethical. So all they can say is, I'm not at liberty to disclose that. So what's your best offer so far? I'm not at liberty to disclose that um, because I want it to be fair to everybody. Uh, a lot of times I might send it out and say, I need the highest and best offer. And, and we're looking at a target above 320. You know, that probably tells you that they probably had a 318 in there and your 305 was, was much, below, you know, so I might I might set a target in there that's different from the initial listing, but I'm I'm gonna let everyone know the same thing. I'm not gonna tell you, yeah, it's you know, you're the last guy to respond, and if you make it 316, you're in because the last guy was at 315. I I don't feel that's fair. It's not illegal. Someone could do that. So if you're the if you're up to the buyer, you ask what's going to take, and maybe they'll tell you because it's not illegal for them to tell you. It's illegal for them to say, I have a $325,000 offer and he's looking really solid. So you have to beat it if they don't. That would be considered puffing and you know unethical. So I, I always just, when I represent the seller side is put the cards on the table. Okay, there's five five people out there and uh, our new target's 320. Not saying what the highest of the other offers was, but I'm saying our new target's 320. So see who gets the closest to that. And, you know, the risk you run of that, if you're representing the seller, is everybody says, well, forget it, right? Uh, so sometimes the safest thing is to say, 
do you want to increase, you know, so here's multiple offer. Do you want to increase your offer? I have five offers and not tell them any number. And they can say, yeah, we'll throw an extra five grand in or no, we want to stand where we are. You'll have fewer people back out of it at that kind of question. than if you set a number up here, hoping you're going to get up here. I mean, we're kind of not in that market today. We will be again. And we were last year. So you, you play it by the market and you just have to make sure your seller understands the risk of the way you're trying to play the game and that they're okay with it and multiple offers. So your, your offer gets accepted. You're going to, you as a buyer's agent are responsible for getting escrow open. So you're going to send a cut. Here's the, here's all the signed documents to the escrow officer. Again, they don't need all of our internal, uh, you know, disclosures, but here's the package. Um, and here's the contact information for my clients, email, phone numbers, et cetera. Uh, please contact them to coordinate this earnest deposit. So maybe you, you know, you picked up a check, kind of the client's old school, and they wanted you to pick up a check, and then you call the title company. Can you send a courier and they'll pick it up from you? They can pick it up directly from the client. If it's, hey, he's going to be at the office all day. Can you pick up, you know, send a courier over to his office and pick up a check? They'll all do that. Or they'll work out a wire transfer situation and communicate appropriately with, uh, they have a pretty good system. They all have a good system to avoid the um, wire transfer getting targeted off to Tanzania. So at that point, you want to get, um, as soon as you have that accepted offer, you're going to get some inspectors' names in your in the hands of your client. I like to have my client pick the inspector, maybe give them a couple of choices. We have a couple of good ones advanced and starts, they both start with an A, so it messes me up. But there's two preferred partners uh, that give you a good starting point. They both have online ordering or someone they can call. So I let my client kind of decide, let them know the inspector is going to need a few hours to inspect. And then they're going to want, depending on the size of the house, uh, the, if you are interested in hearing from the inspector in person, you want to be there at the end. So if, if the inspector is starting at eight, talk to the inspector when you schedule it, but he's probably gonna want to see you at 11. He's not gonna to want to see you at nine because he doesn't want somebody following around the whole time. He wants to do his job and then he'll walk around with you and report. And you've probably been through those having sold your property. So um, within five days of the signed contract, it needs to be in Sky Slope. So, and that counts for new home builds. So if you get a buyer on a new home build and it gets signed, by the corporate office, so they're under contract, needs to be in Sky Slope in five days. Not five days from when they tell you they're going to be done, eight months later or 12 months later, but it needs to be five days from when the contract's signed. I only say that because that seems to be crop up. People go, oh, I didn't know I had to do, do Sky Slope. Um, so review your transaction dates and keep a calendar. So there's a handy form if you want to use it to go through and work through the contract. Uh, we'll pull that up here. And we're going to hit add. Add a form. And we're going to type in date. Doesn't have to be signed by anybody. It's not part of the contract. It'd be a tool for you to use to organize your calendar and use it to read through the contract and pick out all the Critical date list. Dates sometimes go based on the end of the contract. Sometimes they go on the contract date. Sometimes they go off the end of the inspection period. So it's your job to understand where all those come together. But this gives you an idea to go through all the dates you should be watching for. Uh, really good exercise to use that and go through your contract and you know become familiar with that and put the important ones on your calendar. I wouldn't put every one of these on my calendar, but you know, the end of the Binzer and all the important ones you want to have showing up on your contract. But this critical date list, and I have the name in here, um, is, is a real handy tool. However, it does come out in blank because you have every contract is different. So you got to go use it to work through your contract. Um, the Binzer, the buyer's inspection report, if you, it's the inspection period ends the 10th day at midnight from your contract date. The contract date is day zero. 
day one is the following day. So if I get a contract signed today, tomorrow's day one, count 10 days, that's when my 10 days are up, unless I've changed that in the contract. Um, your bins are must be delivered for your buyer to have any right to say something. Otherwise, they're accepting the property and the contract's moving forward. And they're not getting their earnest money back because they changed their mind and don't want it after that 10 days. Um, you should hopefully have a lender that's going to give you weekly updates. Um, your Skyslope is going to require that first update. It doesn't really require the subsequent ones, but you want to know when was the appraisal ordered for your buyer, when are we expecting that in. Um, if the appraiser comes, comes in, you want to know when it comes in, is it okay? That's all you have to tell the other side. It's, if you have a purchase contract for 310, appraisal for 330, good for your buyer. And if the seller's agent says, what did the appraisal come in at? It was adequate. That's all you have to tell them. Uh, if, if the appraisal comes in at 290, then you're going to tell them it came in at 290. So you basically have five days for your buyer to say, I, I want to stay in the deal or I don't, I want out of the deal. And the reality is that five days is used to negotiate the deal. Um, the, the only right in the contract is for the buyer to say, forget it, I want out. So you, you go back to your seller and you say, it's a 290. My guy doesn't have any more cash. Do you want to sell it at 290? Oh, yeah, we'll sell it at 290. Then you need to get an addendum done by both sides selling it at 290 prior to the expiration of your five days or else your buyer's in it at 310 and he's going to have to find another reason to back out of the contract. So um, just that's a, a very critical date that you'll find in today's market is, and it, it's, it's from the date that they've been notified from their lender. So it's a little hard. So you, if you need to be pretty sure your buyer lets you know in case the lender doesn't send you something directly, which they should. Um, but again, if you stay on top of the lender weekly, you're likely going to be, you know, have a good one that's communicating and they'll let you know, hey, appraisal came in short. I don't know what, you know, what you want to do. So that's the date you've been notified. You just heard it, you know. Uh, it, the seller does not have a right to the appraisal. However, if you're trying to negotiate a lower price, you're probably going to want to give it to them because that's your evidence that it needs to be lower. Um, if it came in higher or at value, all, all you're telling them is appraisal came in good because the seller has no right to it. But, well, what did it come in at? It, it's adequate to the purchase price. It's all, it's all you have to tell them. Can I get a copy of it? No, we, you know, that's between the buyer and their lender. So I've reached the end of my page and I talked really fast today, I guess, since I started late because I've normally filled an hour and a half and I didn't. So hopefully you learned a few things. Awesome. Go ahead. Question. Uh, yeah. Uh, what are we playing the training videos on uh, my home group? So let me show you on Broker Shumo here. And I don't put this one in because I don't have it blocked in with them. I just have the Zoom screen recording. So you can text me if you wanted to see the, the my first buyer or my first seller. Mm -hmm. um, so which one's Broker Sumo? Right here. Cancel that. Last recordings right here. So uh, good reference if, if you miss a topic. Everything doesn't get recorded, but uh, a lot of it does. So there's always good good things to go find in here. Uh, you know, this advanced sheet TP was fun. Uh, Aaron has, you know, you can see when he did stuff. So he, he essentially he has a bunch of little ones kind of put together. So he, he did a little meme so that he could lead his in. I needed to probably do that and put my classes in here. But um, I tend to use the Zoom rather than that camera only because sometimes I'm doing so much on the screen that it's going to be hard to read that screen. And it's more important that you see the screen than you see me. If that makes sense. So my first buyer, my first seller, go to the agent helpline, send me a, your email address and a message and I'll forward it out to you. But there's a lot of good good stuff in here. I mean, this advanced chat GPT was a title company, Lindsay from Capital Title. Um, 
mindset mastery. This was three people, and it was a Zoom call that they produced that out of uh, the Teams meeting. So I know one thing to watch for that's coming up in the next couple of weeks is Bob Herzog, who runs our Teams operation, is putting together a um, – it's going to be opening up to, available to all agents to use it. Started out, try to create it for his teams, but a business plan uh, software to, to develop your business plan and then track your business plan and make sure you're on track. So I think it's going to be a really nice tool for our agents to have. And he's supposed to be doing classes over the next probably 30 days announcing that. So if you're interested in saying, okay, how do I get a little more organized and, and figuring out what I need to do to make money? He's going to have a good structure for you. Uh, so, other questions? Answer? I got a dumb question. Oh, there's no dumb question. Remember, I told you that, right? Oh, I, oh, I turned the recorder off, though? I, I turned it I tried to change how they changed it. I was looking at my server. Where... So, and I think they changed the vendor. So, I'm not sure that it's the same way. Let's look at it. So, it used to be you'd come into my account. And I think it's under account settings. So, the short answer is you're going to get a hold of accounting, send a text to, uh, uh, yeah, see, they, they the box is gone. It used to have your credit card here. So the trick was you had to delete it and then add it. So email accounting at myhomegroup.com and they probably have a link to the new vendor that they're going to send you. Not a dumb question. I I went through that a couple of times. Well, I don't carry my business credit card around, so I've lost my wallet like twice in the last year. So kind of painful. <laughs> Other than that, get to know RPR. It's a great tool. Um, and, and it's included in your dues. And I'll, 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 I'll give it like to the, you know. Uh, oh, I, I know the other thing I was going to talk about that's kind of pertinent. Tina comes out from the Crawford Report and does these, or, you know, a lot of times monthly, you should at least try to get it with one of our title partners on there. Her monthly spiel about what's going on in the market and where are the pressures and where are the jobs and where's everything else? Um, I'm, I need to call her because she didn't answer my email, but uh, I'm probably going to put together a little more in-depth, like an hour and a half, two hours of how to, if you subscribe to the Comfort Report, you get a lot more detail. You can drill down to zip code. You can really see what's going on in the local market, not the Valley and you know, Armless as a whole. A uh, lot of good information in terms of helping your seller's price, helping your buyers present their offers, know what's really going on. Um, but the comfort report is a really great statistical model while RPR has that really cool. You can write a script and drop in the stuff. It's good to get attention. If you really want to know the market, we have the best statistical information in the nation with comfort report. Uh, and it's like 30, I think it's $90 a quarter or $35 a month, or you have another discount if you go to a year, um, to sign up. But if you're going to sign up for that, I went to this for the second time to a class to a guy called uh, named Bruce Lieber who te teaches it. He's not affiliated with Cromford, but he's put together. And I'm like, I could teach. I learned like three things. And I'm like, I could do this for our agents for an hour and a half. I'm asking Tina for permission. And then it'll probably show up on the schedule. Um, because if you're going to spend the $30 a month, you need to spend the time to understand how to use the reports. And I've kind of done that. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's very great information to help you understand the sub markets the, the small cities or zip code depending on the stat you're looking at sometimes if you go down to a zip code you don't have enough uh, data to be statistically accurate you have to have a certain pool of data before the data points in a direction so sometimes you have to go to a city a lot of it though you can get down to a down to a data and the market is much of it is approaching a balanced market which means um, you know there's no seller's advantage anymore so the buyers are and, and the buyers are in control and the buyers are scared to death of the interest rates. So, you know, we need to change the narrative and let people know, hey, if if the interest rates go up and you locked in today, you'll feel good. If they go down, you can refinance. If they stay the same, you'll still feel okay. But do you need a house? If you need a house, if the, the problem we have today is that people who don't need a house aren't putting their house on the market, they're going to stay wherever they are. So the market's a little bit frozen, uh, but there are obviously life events that cause people to need a house. They need housing. They just moved here. They got transferred here. 
they are so splitting their household up and they don't want to, you know, divorce. So that's a nice word for divorce, splitting their household up. Uh, you know, that stuff is still going on. People are still, you know, now what you don't have is a buyer that, you know, a couple of years ago would be like, yeah, I really like to have a pool by next summer and, you know, in, in a fourth bedroom. So I, I think I'm just going to go buy that bigger house because it's going to be cheaper than adding a pool to my house and I'll get the fourth bedroom anyway. Well, when you take your interest rate from two and a half to eight, it's not cheaper. It's damn expensive. So they just live with the smaller house with no pool or, you know, it, maybe the pool companies are going to start making a living selling pools to those people because they can't afford to get out of their primary mortgage. So that's keeping the, the, the listing pool down. And so we're still in balance with the buyers, but the buyers are so nervous about the interest rate that they're not reacting. You know, so we're selling. Exactly. They're handcuffed to the interest. They're handcuffed to the interest rate. Yeah, the part is for like these guys, you know, want to like this on the house. I get that case too. But the thing people don't talk about also is the elderly generation, right? Who are just retired. You can talk about me. Go ahead. People that want to move to where you know their kids are, their grandkids are, right? Yeah, they're kind of stuck too. They're kind of stuck. Unless, but the the good news for that generation, my generation, if you can get a hold of them, is they probably have enough equity to sell and buy for cash, right? Because they're ready to downsize. So, you know, I mean, I did this a couple of years ago, and but if I were looking at it today and I had the the big two story house in eight five two five four that you know I sold out, I sold that one years ago, so it wasn't worth that. Then it's worth a million bucks today, today, right? And I'd been in it for twenty years, and I have a two hundred thousand dollar mortgage that's paid down to one ten. What do I care? I go give some young family that needs a big house uh, some incentive on the interest rate buy down. So I give them thirty, fifty thousand dollars incentive to buy their interest rate down. They get to the bigger house they need, and I have eight hundred thousand dollars. I can go buy a mansion in Nebraska where my kids are, or 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 buy in Sun City West and be on the golf course where I want to be for cash. So if you can get that empty nester, the, the me, you can get. Look, I'm your I'm your model. I'm a couple years ahead of you. So on, on the model for that, if you can get that person that stayed in their house and didn't lever it up for buying a boat and doing all the other supporting shit, the kids. supporting the kids, <laughs> you know, paying for college, and so the house isn't levered up, if you can get those people, it's a great time for them to make How a many house. houses are in the South right now? Or 13, 15, where are we on Oh, it's probably... I'm sorry? That sounds about right. 14 to 15, it seems to be bouncing. And we're selling... 6500 a month but you know we should be told, selling 12 a month and there's you know tens how many tens of thousands of us are there out there uh you know the, the, there's countless more that are active because the, the, you know even if you haven't had a transaction you're still active because you're here you're trying to learn you're trying to work the business versus if if you count our whatever we have in Maricopa County I don't know the number is 45 50,000 agents well half of those never intended to buy or sell do anything but maybe put their name on their own contract at a new home builder you know that's that's it so you can cut half of those out but you, you're still somewhere north of twenty thousand people that would like to make some sort of a living part-time or full-time out of real estate and we're selling six thousand houses a month that's 36 a year that's like one and a quarter houses a year not a lot of livings it it's harder to, you got to fight more you got to fight more for your share to be bigger than average so there's deals out there there's deals to be had um you know i've got a listing and it's really quiet on open houses right now so that that's you know sometimes a a, a good opportunity to meet somebody new because um but the the buyers who need to buy are probably touring houses with agents so it's harder to get in front of them. So you have to figure out in your sphere or figure out a way to get in front of those people. Uh, these you know, open houses, if, if you if nothing else, that's a good base to start and get you out there. But it's quiet right now. You know, people aren't people aren't driving the neighborhood. And going, ah, I have to get something just a little bit bigger. You know, I'm scared to get something a little bit bigger because my interest rate. I mean, if you think about it, just two years ago. Uh, four and three quarters they were screaming that that was high and that seems like a great deal right now it's a phenomenal deal so the people that are really smiling are the ones that three years ago got two and three quarters 
and they're not moving at all anytime soon. And the people that, you know, went last year and were paying five and three quarters to six and a quarter are like, oh, you know, I'm not going anywhere. And they, you know, so it's a challenge, but it's doable and there's business to be had out there. So you just have to, you know, get in touch with more, get in front of more people. It's a numbers game. And, then, you know, the percentage is going to be lower than you could get before. So you have to contact more people. So have a bigger sphere. Go dance on TikTok or something. I don't know. <laughs> is that what you did? To get the That's what I did to get the business. Yeah. <laughs> da, 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 da. <laughs> yeah. That's what? probably not going to be my platform of choice. I'm probably, I keep kicking, keep kicking myself for not doing more YouTube videos over the years that I started doing a bunch and then I laid off. And you mean like just regular YouTube videos or like those TikTok videos? I mean, like regular YouTube videos, like long form. Although, so what? I mean, yeah, the shorts. I mean, I mean, I'm gonna. I'm done wanting to record this, so 